Okay, good evening and welcome uh, to our General Council of December 14th. Uh, I first would like to begin uh, by number one on our agenda, which is uh, the identification of any media on the line. Hello, it's Dawn from the Bureau of Times. Oh, I hear you both. <laughs> <laughs> Donna Thank from the Bureau so Times. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. And welcome, uh, Victoria from the Turtle Island as well. Uh, I'll next go to any uh, changes uh, or additions or deletions to the agenda. Seeing or hearing none, I'll look now to a motion for mover and seconder to adopt our agenda of December 14th. Moved by Audrey, seconder. I'll second Melba. Second by... Oh, okay, I'll give it over to Melba. <laughs> See you though, share later. So it's moved and seconded. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? See or hearing none, the motion is carried. Uh, we do have a few delegations with us this evening. I know there's these are from our ethics committee. Uh, there were some conflict issues, I believe, at that time, which is why they're all now uh, going to be coming in front of full council. Our first delegation uh, is the co-creation of Indigenous water quality presentation. Uh, which is through the research team at McMaster University uh, with Don Martin Hill as well as Charles Lanny. I hope I pronounced your last name correct. If not, please correct me. Uh, I'll, at this point in time, I will uh, again welcome each of you uh, to General Counsel uh, and pa uh, pass the floor right over to yourself. It looks like Don, maybe you be, will be introducing this, uh, this presentation. Yeah, hi, sorry, I'm still in route, so. Um, not the best circumstances, but I'm just here to basically, I gave the Environment Committee um, our report uh, for Oneganos um, GWF uh, project, co-creation of indigenous water quality tools and the traditional ecological knowledge grant. Um, we were asked by the Environment uh, Committee to present the climate change modeling that Tariq uh, did Tariq Dean and Atla Farain, and they are here to present that. And then in meeting with um, Nathan and uh, Darren, we decided that we'll maybe present a little bit more in another council when I'm not en route. Um, but just to give a brief overview, we have about 128 people faculty, community, community researchers, PhD students, uh, master students, and undergrad indigenous studies students that have worked on this project. We wrapped up the first phase, which is essentially identifying the issues that Six Nations would be facing on their water quality and quantity and ecosystem health. There's far too much to present. Um, so the suggestion is maybe we host a community uh, information for one day and all the researchers can present their findings. Um, but having said that, we have Lori Davis Hill as a community lead who keeps everybody in mind. And we also have um, worked with other departments at Six Nations to guide us and Again, keep us in line. All of our publications are co-authored with community folks, the Mental Health uh, Birthing Center. Um, we're just now publishing. Um, we have results from a number of different uh, ecosystem health that, that are in progress in a climate change book. Uh, we've won an award from Princeton University to publish a book. Um, together uh, as a team, and that's now just starting. So we have quite a bit to report, but today I think it's just simplify it and have Tariq uh, present what the uh, Environment Committee wanted, if that's okay. And then I have just a few asks of council regarding moving forward and looking at maybe getting some um, some things addressed. One is, you know, office space in the community. Um, I think I've approached you, Mark, on that one. <laughs> um, 
it would be really good if the team had, you know, a place. And I know because of COVID, so much was shut down. Um, and we're just trying to recalibrate and, and get going again. Um, so that was one major thing I kind of needed to know. And then two, if, if hosting an information session together through council or in some capacity, making sure the community has access to the information, um, we'd be more than happy to do that as a research team. So those are the two things I wanted to bring forward. Um, outside of that, thank you for having us. And I, uh, I think Charles already presented um, to the Environment Committee. So maybe um, we, he can present next time, but I think the climate change modeling uh, is what was identified as, as what they wanted presented tonight, if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Nyama, Don, uh, for, for joining us and, and walking us through uh, the, uh, the, the, really the context uh, in the background to this presentation. I also uh, will look to your two requests uh, after the presentation and we can have a discussion on those two pieces. Uh, and just want to at this time welcome Tariq and Atlif uh, to general counsel uh, and we'll look to pass it to one of you to walk us through the presentation. We're scheduled for about 15 minutes or so on the presentation portion. So thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. Uh, can I share my screen or? Yes, you should be able to share your screen with no issues. Okay, thank you. If I can maybe just ask council if there are any questions, if maybe just for time's sake, because we do have a few uh, delegations to maybe hold on your questions and allow Tariq Atlif uh, to walk through the presentation. Um, and then we will look to any questions uh, at the end of the presentation. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so um, I'm gonna be presenting some of our work on climate change impact projections within Six Nations. Uh, so just a little background on the, the main goal of our research. Uh, what we're trying to do is better understand how climate change is impacting the Six Nations area. And we have three sub objectives. Uh, the first is to explore changes to climatic, climatic extremes and climate conditions. Uh, the second is to explore the effects of climate change and water usage on the Mackenzie Creek. And the third is to explore the impacts of climate change on the Mackenzie Creek water quality. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be presenting um, our work on sub objective one and part of sub objective two. Uh, so, climatic changes within Six Nations. So, um, just looking at changes in temperature. So, the image that you see on the left are um, changes in annual temperature relative to a baseline value, which is 7.8 degrees Celsius. And uh, we can see, so in the black, that's the observed temperature, the measured temperature throughout the 20th century. Um, and the blue line is the future temperature under a intermediate warming scenario. And then the red line is a higher level warming scenario, uh, again, for the future period. And the shaded area are just the, the ranges within the climate models that we're using. Um, so in terms of future temperature, what we expect to see um, in three different periods is that uh, between 2006 and 2039, um, temperature will increase about 1.6 to 0.7 degrees Celsius. Uh, by the mid-century, between 2040 and 2069, uh, temperature will have increased between 2.7 and 3.4 degrees Celsius. And by the end of the century, temperature will have increased uh, 3.2 to 5.4 degrees Celsius. Um, one thing I should note is that when we're dealing with climate projections, as you move further into the future, there is a a greater deal of uncertainty within the um, uh, within the projections. So that's important to keep in mind. However, the, the overall trend that we tend to see is that there is an increase in annual average temperature 
and there is going to be an increase in seasonal temperature within Six Nations. When we look at precipitation, uh, so again, the black line is observed total precipitation, and then the blue and the red are just two different future scenarios. Um, we see that between uh, 1950 and 2000, there was an increase in total precipitation of about 42 millimeters. Um, by the end of the century, we expect to see precipitation increasing between 95 millimeters to 130 millimeters. Um, so the, the overall takeaway here is that um, overall temperature, uh, overall precipitate, total precipitation will increase, but there will be seasonal variability. So um, when we dis disaggregate the, the annual precipitation into seasonal precipitation, we see that um, there is an increase in winter, spring, and fall precipitation, but a decrease in summer precipitation. Uh, so moving on to climate, extreme, climate extremes, uh, we have a set of indices that we're using to uh, project future climate extremes. Uh, on the left here, you can see some of these uh, results. Um, so just going through them one by one. Um, we looked at, um, what, what we saw is that there is going to be a decrease in uh, cold days and cold nights. So those are days when maximum and minimum temperature are below zero degrees Celsius. And you can see here uh, the decrease in cold days. Um, but there's going to be an increase in warm nights and warm days. And uh, the image here um, is showing the increase in warm nights, which are um, nights when minimum temperature is above 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then when we look at warm spells, so these are um, the total amount of days that are part of a warm spell within each year. Uh, we see that these warm spells are becoming longer, will become longer and longer um, uh, each year into the future. Um, so the takeaway is that uh, there is, uh, like I said, seasonal ver um there's a seasonal increase in warming. Um, when we look at uh, days when temperature is below zero, that tends to be in winter. So there's a warming trend if, if the number of days are going down. Conversely, when we look at days when temperature is above 20 degrees Celsius, which is, tends to be in summer, we see an overall increase in the number of these days. So uh, an increase in summer temperature. And then when we look at uh, the increase in heat spells, um, we see that there's a greater potential for heat related illnesses and environmental stresses related to these um, uh, extreme heat uh, 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 periods. Uh, next, looking at precipitation. So, um, uh, what we see is that there is going to be an increase in single um, uh, high rainfall event days. So, these are days when rainfall is above 10 or 20, degree, uh, 20 millimeters. Um, this image here is looking at uh, days when precipitation is above 20 millimeters. Uh, and then we see an increase in rainfall intensity. Uh, so these two images are looking at um, the, the total amount of rainfall that are, are part of single events that are above the 90th percentile. And then the image on the bottom is looking at the, the um, the annual, the annual maximum of precipitation within a, um, a five-day precipitation event. So the takeaway here is that um, uh, there is an overall increase in the trend of extreme rainfall, um, both in terms of the frequency and the intensity of rainfall events. So this has consequences for, um, for flooding within the region. Uh, and I should note that um, all of the work that we've done on climate extremes has been published and it's all freely available um, online. And uh, the paper goes into much more detail on the individual um, trends within the climate extremes. Uh, so next I wanna talk about the modeling work that we're doing. So we're looking at modeling 
uh, we're looking at simulating future stream flow within the Mackenzie Creek. Um, so if uh, we were to look at this image on the right here, uh, the shaded green area is the Mackenzie Creek subwatershed. And um, this blue line here is the Mackenzie Creek that runs through Six Nations. Um, the, uh, the creek is a, or the creek has high concentrations of phosphorus, chloride, nitrogen, and sediment. Uh, and this is mainly transported during high flow uh, events. So um, when there's high, uh, um, when there are high rainfall events, we see um, uh, these uh, um, contaminants being trans transported into the Mackenzie Creek. Uh, So what we uh, what we are doing is we're modeling the Mackenzie Creek. Um, so the the two images uh, that are important are the the two on the right here, C and D. Um, and what we see is that there's going to be an increase in winter stream flow. Um, so this has a greater potential for winter stream flooding. Uh, conversely, we see little change within summer stream flow. So um, what this might mean is a greater potential for water stress within those months, especially if overall summer temperatures increasing, uh, there might be a greater stress on water resources during those periods. So the, a summary um, of what I just talked about, uh, what we see is that there's an overall increase in the maximum and minimum temperature within Six Nations. Um, there is going to be an increase in the number of heat spell days. So uh, if we recall back to the summer when we had those um, extreme heat warnings, uh, those type of events might become much more prevalent um, in the future. Also, there is correlation between increases in temperature and the effect it has on, um, on um, human health. So as temperatures continue to increase and as we get these more um, uh, th these more extreme heat events, um, there might be more um, heat-related illnesses that occur within Six Nations. Um, when we look at precipitation, there is a decrease in summer precipitation, um, but an overall increase in the frequency and the intensity of extreme rainfall events. Uh, so this might lead to more flooding, um, but also more drought, um, uh, drought-like conditions within the summer periods. Um, and then finally, what we're doing right now is looking at um, a future stream flow. So with uh, an increase in winter stream flow, what we might expect to see is more uh, winter spring flooding. And um, the image here, the map, uh, that, um, that's here, that's showing the different flood lines of the Mackenzie Creek as it passes through um, um, uh, Six Nations. Um, also, because there is a greater, because there is uh, little change within um, summer stream flow, but there will be uh, more change, uh, there, there will be a, a greater increase in summer temperature that might mean a greater water stress potential uh, during those months. Uh, so what can the community do, do with this information? Um, so we know that climate change is and will continue to impact Six Nations. Uh, what we, um, uh, what, what, what can be done with this information is uh, it can be incorporated within the 2000 um, nine Six Nation Community Action Plan, specifically the goals related to climate change. Um, so uh, our, we, we believe that our work can feed into um, uh, the community climate change study. Uh, it can be integrated within uh, emergency planning uh, and it can help uh, with the uh, community climate change ed education initiative. Uh, so the future work that we're doing, um, so we know the temperature is increasing. Uh, what this will mean in terms of the growing season length is that um, the number of days that uh, will be feasible, that um, 
will be a part of this growing season. Each year will expand as temperature continues to increase. But with that expansion in the growing season, there will be seasonal variability in, in precipitation. Um, and at the moment, only a fraction of the permitted water that's um, only a fraction of the permitted water is taken from the Mackenzie Creek. Uh, so what would happen when more water is needed for ir uh, agricultural irrigation within the subwatershed? So what we want to do is develop water use scenarios for the Mackenzie Creek to simulate how um, hydrological processes within the Mackenzie Creek subwatershed will be affected by different water use scenarios. Uh, and then we also want to explore how climate change will impact um, the Mackenzie Creek water quality. Um, and that's something that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, so that's everything that I have at the moment. Um, uh, we're happy to answer any questions, either myself or Dr. Arain, um, or you can send us an email at, uh, our emails are on the screen at the moment. Um, thank you. And I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Tariq, for, for walking us through that presentation. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot here that, you know, we need to digest and figure out our action to these items. And I think it's so uh, great to, you know, since the implementation of, uh, of the environment committee and the, you know, the work that they've taken on and with the chairperson, Councillor Wright has been, we, we've almost been just throwing constant issues, it seems like, uh, to the environment committee. So, you know, it's nice to see some of the work that's, that's being, uh, you know, contributed out of. Uh, the committee itself and this is really important work and I also uh, you know I'm very pleased to see our community plan as well as that's to me as such a, a guiding document to where we can start to achieve you know the priorities and in, in which basically are laid out but obviously need to you know further fine-tune so you know to me there's a lot of good good things even though climate change is hit very much a reality and, and scary at times but I think, you know, we need, that's exactly why we do this type of work so that we can prepare. I think we have the other piece I was glad to see is like our emergency management plan. Uh, you know, we need to also look to those areas. Council also made a motion last general finance in relation to the flooding and ditching. And those, all, you know, those are, are all issues that we need to do the work on now in order to, to help mitigate any further risks. So uh, those were some of the points I took away from your presentation and really appreciate it. Uh, you walking us through through that. Uh, I want to now look to any uh, further questions or comments from council. I see Nathan has his hand raised and then over to Audrey. Thanks, Chief, and, and thanks, Tariq, for the presentation and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Hill for your team and, and your continuous work and Atif uh, also for your contributions as well. I think these are, um, uh, you know, I, I, in terms of the, the work going forward, a couple of things just to reiterate to um, and, and expand upon, and, and Chief, you already mentioned it, the, the impacts to the, the other areas, and, and I see the work going forward in environment really doing um, uh, some of the de-siloing uh, effects within our, our departments where um, climate change has such an impact um, in, in emergency management, as you highlighted. Uh, public works is going to have to now look at ways to factor in um, different effects of climate change uh, into their budgets, uh, health, and the health effects and, and how this uh, also impacts human beings uh, as well as illnesses. So it, it's really taking that and using this information um, to, to really look at ways to strategically break down those silos and, and look for an avenue for change. Um, and, and I'm really excited about the work. And, and like Chief said, it's, it's, not, it's exciting to get to this point uh, but it's it's not exciting to to see you know these effects of of uh, what was done to to Mother Earth and how Mother Earth is um, uh, fighting back really uh, in terms of these pieces. Uh, so I wanted to highlight those um, as well as um, kind of look at 
um, the information in a way that we can actually start uh, formulating that action plan and, and getting to the nitty gritty of, of how, as you highlighted, our community plan as it relates to climate change. I think there's a lot uh, of work we could do. And, and now it's about getting this information out to the community and, and working through that in, in, a, in a very constructive manner. Um, so uh, going forward, I, I see lots of opportunities uh, to break down the silos, uh, but also um, doing it in a way that's um, uh, kind of uh, gets, gets us to the point where we're getting some of the, these effects done and we're ready. I think, you know, anyone that was outside on Saturday, last Saturday, you saw the, the effects of climate change and, and how that's going to impact our community. And that's just going to increase uh, on a yearly basis. So thank you for the work. And, and I look forward to uh, working with uh, all of my colleagues to figure out a good pathway um, to get a lot of these impacts mitigated, I guess is the word I'm looking for, uh, mitigated in a way that we can uh, continue to uh, live and coexist on Mother Earth together. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Hala, for your comments, uh, Nathan. Uh, I have Audrey uh, in line next. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I think the team did a, a wonderful job on it. I, I, one of the first things that I, I, I was going to suggest and I am suggesting is that this whole presentation be available to the entire community. We have brilliant people in our community. And I think this is bigger than council, it's bigger than just the programs. It's a whole community based, as well as our surrounding neighbors as well, because we are connected, all of us, all up and down, down the Haldeman track and uh, the world. So I, one of the first thing, questions that I have for you is, um, you, you explained about the contaminants that are phosphorus, et cetera, chloride, uh, where are these coming from that are being flushed into on high rain days into the Mackenzie Creek? Is this coming from the farmland? Is it coming from uh, up, uh, upstream? It's uh, it's coming from agricultural runoff, so main, mainly farmland. Okay, and the second question I have is, um, I guess um, the what can we do about this is, is the biggest question. I don't know if you're going to do more presentations, but I think the, the question we all have to ask ourselves is what can we do individually to help me mitigate these problems? And that's one of the things where you start, even small things make a big difference, as we all know. And that, what, what can we do in the, the bigger groups as we go along? Maybe uh, I can ask. I'll go ahead, Atlas. Yes, I, I, I think it's uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving this, uh, Chief uh, Mark Hill. So, thanks for giving us this opportunity to present the results. The presentation is available, and also the paper ha that has been published is available. Open access is available to uh, everyone. Uh, there is information at a longer time scale, but there is also information at the shorter time scale, 20 years, 30 years. So the quantitative numbers, they can be used for any planning. Uh, let's, say not, let's not look at end of the century, let's look what is next 30 years, next 25 years. That's more like a scenario that we plan. So that information is there. So those numbers are there. How much will be the change in what uh, term? So, so the most useful information is the preparedness by the community that rather than uh, being caught all of a sudden, uh, we have seen a few years ago, there was a flooding in January or February, there was a flooding uh, we have seen in the Grand River. So, so we are not caught off guard. And we saw this big tornado chain, everyone is caught off guard, like 300 miles of uh, tornadoes uh, happening because warming means more water in the air, more heat in the air, more power in these events. The what we will see here is a shorter intense drought. So in the past, we said the whole year is the drought, Going forward, we will see is the two week, three week, four week intense drought, intense heat coming uh, over uh, these kind of things we see. 
individually we can do a lot uh, in terms of the green, reducing greenhouse gas emissions plus uh, uh, I think care for the environment. Uh, First Nations are already ahead caring for the earth as compared to a lot more people. So I think a lot more people have to learn uh, okay. from uh, the community, uh, the way of living and conserving the environment. Uh, so so that, that I would uh, say, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I might just, thanks Atlif. I might just add, you know, one of the things we've been working on and is you know concerns about the aquifer uh, extraction that these companies are doing, particularly Nestle, was taking 3.6 million liters um, a, a day, and they uh, Doug Ford just approved um, Blue Triton, who bought Nestle, um, to take even more, and and that impact is going to be quite significant um, because when you remove the groundwater. Uh, you're exasperating the drought conditions that we're going to be dealing with. But more importantly to me as a community member and a, and a grandmother is that water is precious. That, that water is, is made for humans to drink. It's the best you can get. Um, and we need to protect it as much as possible mm. because water is going to be the new gold. It is going to be worth more than oil it's almost worth more than oil so the fact that these companies are extracting millions and millions of liters a day and six nations has not had a voice has not um, uh, been able to uh, negotiate anything with these companies in other countries they've been forced to at least give the water uh, back to communities that are water insecure so if there's anything manageable that we could do, it would be to be far more visible and active. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Blue Triton posted on their website um, that Six Nations elected council had no response to their taking of uh, water and therefore it was okay. They also said HCC, but HCC had sent out a cease and desert this a cease and desist order so something as as basic as not allowing because under united nations law under unesco at the un the, i'm on the hydrology committee groundwater is supposed to be protected and not a commodity because it's so rare and there's going to be over uh, uh two billion people that are going to be without water worldwide so it, it's a worldwide global uh, issue crisis so whatever exists you should protect it that's one thing for the Mackenzie Creek um, talking to elders talking to the traditional people as well as to the scientists um, it's a matter of removing 30 year old beaver dams that are no longer used by the beaver and you have a buildup in those places of things like E. coli so that makes them far more contaminated than they need to be because Mother Earth can clean herself. We just need to, to remove things. We don't need a, a big plan outside of letting her flow freely so she can clean herself out. Um, right now, we pulled out ATM machines, car batteries. Um, so that those are things that the community could do if they um, you know, did things on Earth Day, like kind of planning, let's, you know, clean up our waters, let's remove um, old, old uh, garbage that's in there. Um, so it's, it's a matter, it really is going to take the whole community to, to help out, both with protecting our source water. The third thing is considering putting up a water station at Six Nations, um, because climate change is going to impact our, our, avail our, our water quality and we're going to be in a bit of a trouble 20 years down the road so it would be good to start preparing um, to be independent should we experience a disaster um, like you're seeing in British Columbia we need to be able to be looking after each other and self-sustaining so a preparedness plan would be really helpful and we'd be more than happy to help with that and and help create whatever avenues need be to facilitate protecting our water, taking care of it better, 
and, and putting in uh, the work that's required to prepare our community for any kind of disaster. Um, we've been negotiating and talking to Maori. Um, they have an excellent preparedness plan to be self uh, independent um, should anything happen. So I think those are things that the community would definitely um, benefit from. Yeah. What, one other point I would like to uh, make here uh, with regards to what Don has said. So uh, uh, Thari, can you share that image, the, the map of the Boston Creek and the Mackenzie Creek? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so this map shows the Mackenzie Creek and the Boston Creek. When we did the simulation, when we run the model, we run for both. So Mackenzie Creek and the Boston Creek uh, together because this covers the lot of area. But we showed the results only for Mackenzie Creek because we did not have a validation station at the Boston Creek. So some hydrometric uh, measurements, if they are done, there are stations, but they're not at the end of the Boston Creek. So there, are two, there may be two ways, these are suggestions, whether uh, there can be hydrometric measurements, how much water is flowing in this creek in the Six Nations uh, area here, or uh, the Grand River Conservation Authority can be approached uh, by the chief office because that will be more uh, uh, influential or uh, have impact. That there should be a measurement station at the end of the Boston Creek because that's, uh, that passes through the area, it covers it would be important for the measurements then we can use as a validation tool for the models or we can quantify for the future, it would be important. So I just wanted to make this point at this forum so that is uh, conveyed. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you to, uh, so much uh, as well. I know that these are all, we're all looking for those, those really the, I guess the tangible, uh, you know, things that we can get done with the reality of the timing that we have left in this term. I think there's some things that obviously is going to take a long time to get you know, completed, but as long as foundational work is laid and we continue to you know, progress that, I think is the key to this as well. Just, and I wanted to ask uh, one further question to Don, because I know we've went back and forth and, I, and we've, I've had conversations with our CAF team and like say in regards to Nestle, in fact, it's it's actually more of you know, the municipalities taking out of groundwater than it is the water bottle companies. So why, if we're going to target just the water bottle companies, don't you think we should be going after the municipalities that are taking that water as well? I think you need to go after every single person and company. Um, go, I mean, the, everything from the gypsum plant all the way to the municipality, but the thing about bottling water is they're making so much money off of a resource. Think of it as oil. Like just say, no, okay, it's not no, water, it's oil. How would I you feel exactly. that they're taking it without giving us a dime while there's women at Six Nations that are, are we've surveyed who are struggling, young mothers trying to purchase water on a limited budget and carry it up the stairs. So that's kind of just the, the principle of them. It's, it's not, it, it's just beyond measure that we're not receiving anything, any support or money back when it's our resources literally under our feet. So that would be bottling companies are being attacked across the board by indigenous people because they don't need to be doing that. There's water in those countries is purely for profit. It's, no, it's yeah, a profit. I, thank, yeah. you. thank you for that. I, I totally understand those points that you've raised. I'm just saying from our perspective, uh, you know, a more cohesive collective plan to the overall issue as opposed to just targeting one, like when we talked, uh, you know, through the CAP team and so forth, these are the types of questions that are being asked, you know, by, by certain individuals coming forward to, the CAP team. And I think that's the process that we need to even further uh, get aligned with the political priorities in which we are trying to accomplish. And I think this is just one example where, you know, aligning, uh, you know, our, our work will only go even further to the 
entire collective, which is why I, I, I you know, more or less thinking, I guess, broadly amongst the issue in its entirety. Mm -hmm. No, there's a lot of people I, using the water, not just Nestle. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, looking to any further questions or comments and also recognizing time. Okay, see, oh, I see Sherry Lynn has her hand up. And then back over to Audrey. Sherry Lynn, you have the floor? Um, yeah, are you gonna put on the floor to do some letters? To letter to Ford and um, this, new, this new company. And the municip municipality's water ends up in the, back in the watershed, does it? Instead of like, because Nestle exports it, right? Yeah, no, it's purely for profit, it's exported. Yeah. Nestle is right. Okay. Yeah. So yes. Well, now it's Blue Triton. It's not. Nestle left because of the pressure across Canada, because they just have a horrible human rights record. Blue Triton bought it, but what that means with Blue Triton is our water is now being sold on the free market, which is something I think the UN um, did not want to see happen. And Canada is one of the first to put your water. So now there's people all over the world that own our water and it makes it much tougher to deal with now because you have, it's like oil. They will defend that company in a different way. So it, it's really complex. So, so I'll put on the floor um, to do the letters to Ford, this um, new company and whoever else that um, we need to send these letters to so it can get done. Okay, maybe if also to just so that there's just further due diligence uh, on these issues as well, just so that we have all the facts, I think is, is important on, on, on those two, uh, Sherilyn. Is there a, a mover or a seconder to Sherilyn's motion? Second by Audrey. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing our hearing on motion is carried. I also would like to look to a motion uh, in terms of our next steps. And I know we touched a little bit about on these two requests. Um, one was the second piece that Don had had was in relation to hosting info session nights. I think Audrey, you were touching on this point and Nathan had alluded to it in the chat. I'm wondering maybe if it, it goes even a little bit step further of uh, maybe I don't know how or who can help develop almost like a community campaign where we have all these sessions laid out on a, like for the full year. Uh, and then we can go to each, you know, in terms of communication and getting those out. I just wonder maybe in, uh, out of some deliverables out of this presentation so that we're not just accepting the information as or as information rather, uh, but, uh, you know, also further action attached so that we kind of keep this at the forefront. As we all know, there's many other priorities as well. I see Nathan has his hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks Chief, I really love that idea. And, and I think that's something I'll, I'm happy to put a motion down in is, is that we develop that campaign as well as that series of presentations in conjunction with an action plan. Um, that way the information gets out to the community. The community is actually working with us in, in developing the solutions um, coming right from the community and they, they're forming the action plan. So I'll put that motion down definitely um, that we get going on that. Second okay, that's great. Thank you so much for that. It's moved by Nathan and seconded by Audrey. And also just to uh, recognize uh, Don's comment in the chat to include strategy sessions that, that, that can very much be built in uh, to that as well. So I'll add look that, to, add to my motion too. Okay, perfect. That's good with the seconder as well. Okay, yes. already I'll look to any further questions or comments from council in relation to the latest motion. Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none motion is carried. Uh, the last item I just wanna to touch on is the office space, Don. So I'm wondering if maybe, um, I see Don smiling. I, I wonder if maybe I can just touch base with our SAO, uh, Darren, uh, just to maybe if we can add this on our radar. So that I know we've been talking a little bit about this in terms of the building of the department in itself in relation to environment. 
or rather that's a department or whatever it looks like. But at this point, they need do need space. So wondering just SAO, if you could um, provide comment on, on just even including this on our radar so that we can start to look for space. Yes, absolutely, Chief. Thank you. Um, we are a bit challenged with space at the moment, but you know, given COVID, we've been able to look at sharing of office space and that has kind of resulted in some areas being opened up. And uh, I know with Rod, Rod Whitlow uh, being, being brought on as our environmental lead, um, and we've also hired an environmental officer in support of this initiative as well. So um, the other thing that we're looking at doing in the new year um, as part of our infrastructure planning is, is developing some more office space. Um, in almost, in a, in a sense, commercial as well as as um, as office, so it's a it's a revenue generating uh, uh, concept as well. Uh, so it's it's something that we're we're really looking to to really accelerate into the new year. But certainly, Don and, and company, we can look at some short term solutions um, in, in in the next few months for sure. So it's definitely on the list. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Darren. Uh, okay, uh, Atlas, Terry, I really want to say Noah to each of you for joining us this evening uh, and presenting to our community. Uh, oh, sorry, really quick, I see Sherry Lynn has her hand up. Did you want to wait a second reading on those two, Chief? That would be great, sure. Moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder. Second. Second by Audrey. Oh, thanks, Nathan. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing your hearing on motion is carried for waiving second meeting. Again, gentlemen, it was a again great honor for you to join us uh, this evening and look forward to our future uh, uh, presentations to our community and, and really the building of, of our next steps and actionizing uh, the items. So thank you for joining us as well. Always okay. now it's to you, Don. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Part of the opportunity. Now wait, now wait, to read. Good night, Liff. You've done an amazing job. Thank, thank you. you. 100%. Thanks a lot. Take care. Now Happy everybody. Monday. Bye. Okay, Council, uh, that leads us into our next delegation, who I believe I do see on the line. Uh, this is in relation to, uh, it looks like, a the History Canada, Canada series, Our War featuring Tom Longo. Uh, we have on the line, from what I see uh, on my list, Jean Parsons, Janine Jameson, as a Six Nations community member, Parsons as Lark Productions, as well as Aaron Haskett and Tex. And I apologize, Tex, I cannot pronounce your name. So if you can do so while introducing yourself, that would be great. Welcome all to General Council. And maybe I'll pass the floor over to you, Jean, to start us off, or maybe Janine. Hi, thank you so much for, um, for having us. Uh, we're very excited to be here. Um, we do have Six Nations members, Janine, uh, Janine Jamison and her son Jagger Miller on the line. And I believe they wanted to kick us off with a few opening words. Hi there, my name is Janine Jamison. Um, I'm from the Six Nations community. Um, here with me is my son Jagger Miller. And we are, um, the direct descendants of Tom Longbolt. So Tom Longbolt Sr. is my great grandpa, which means uh, Tom Longbolt Jr. would be my grandpa and he would be my mom's father. And this is my son, Jagger. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Jagger Miller. Um, I'm excited uh, for the opportunity to learn about, about my great, great grandpa. Uh, I, I didn't really know much about him before, and I wanted to appreciate uh, Lark Productions for making this documentary about him, uh, but like not only for me, but uh, for the community as a whole. Uh, really good to see you, Janine uh, and Jagger, and I look forward to uh, the, the, the presentation this evening and, and the uh, actual discussion. Tonyama for that. Thank you. Thank you, Janine and Jagger. My name's Erin Haskett. I'm with Lark Productions. And thank you, Chief Hill and Council for welcoming us to speak today and getting us so quickly on your agenda. Uh, I run uh, Lark Productions. I'm the president and executive producer. And with me today is Jean Parsons, our vice president of Unscripted, and Tex Antonucci. Antonucci. See, I work with him every day, and I can't pronounce his last name today. Um, our Vice President of Business Affairs. 
both our producers on our new series, Our War. Janine, Tex, and I live and work in Vancouver and acknowledge that we are situated on Indigenous lands known as the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We thank them for caring for these lands and waters. To give you a brief history of LARC, we are based in Vancouver and our production company was founded in 2010. We do scripted television and unscripted television series. We are a small boutique company and we have a history of making socially relevant observational documentaries like Emergency Room, Life and Death at Vancouver General Hospital and Paramedics, Life on the Line for Knowledge Network here in British Columbia. LARC has a commitment to making content that is in dialogue with the important cultural conversations of our day. We like to focus on inclusive storytelling and this new project highlights our commitment to share our new perspectives. We are here to ask permission to film for three to four days with Janine and Jagger's family on Six Nations, Six Nations territory and to film new episodes or new elements for an episode of a new series called Our War. I will turn to Jean who will share a little more details of this series. Hello, Chief Hill and Council. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so our series is called Our War. Our War is a four-part event series for Remembrance Day. It will air um, next November on the History Channel. And the intention and purpose of the series is to celebrate, honor, and reflect on the war stories of our ancestors. We want to feature a different way into the idea of remembrance, one that starts with young people in the present, who go on an investigation to uncover the lost war stories of their ancestors. Um, the idea came from, you know, my own story. My family is here because of World War II. On my mother's side, I'm a second generation immigrant from Eastern Europe. My grandmother and great grandmother came to Canada after fleeing the war as refugees. Um, I knew them both. My great grandmother was actually alive until I was 20. Um, but whenever I would try to ask them about what happened, they would tear up, they would go silent, and they've both since passed away. And I've always been left wondering, you know, what really happened to our family? I think that's quite common. It seems um, that there are so many family war stories for so many different reasons that have been lost. And our series, Our War, is about bringing them back into the light. So each episode of Our War cuts between two stories. Um, and these descendant characters will go on an investigation, scouring museums and archives across Canada, uh, working with experts, historians, and elders to uncover those last details of their ancestor's story. Behind the scenes, we have teams of historical researchers, um, you know, working to make sure every descendant's journey is packed with emotional reveals and meaningful archive, like maybe photos they've never seen or letters in their ancestors' hand, war diaries. Um, you know, really working behind the scenes to help solve the answers to each character's most burning questions. Um, it is important to us that our war presents a version of Remembrance Day that truly reflects on the entire population of Canada. We're collaborating with various communities to tell a broad spectrum of stories, including the descendant of one of Canada's first Black soldiers and a family whose home was taken away as part of the BC government's shameful Japanese internment program. So we've been in conversation with uh, Janine and Jagger, uh, Tom Longboat's direct descendants, as well as with Cindy Martin to produce an episode that would honor and celebrate um, famous Onondaga runner and soldier Tom Longboat. Uh, since we are fortunate to have Janine and Jagger with us today, I don't wanna to spoil too much for them about the episode specifics. Um, but, you know, our researchers have already found some really fascinating details about Longboat's war service that we're excited to share with the national audience. Uh, it, broadly speaking, we would plan to take Jagger and Janine on a journey from Six Nations to locations across Canada that chronologically tell the story of Longboat's early life and military service. Um, we will, of course touch on and celebrate his incredible athletic history. But since Jagger and Janine's questions focus on Longboat's war story, our episode would focus on that specific mystery. Um, Longboat's amazing athlete story actually does feature in his war service in a pretty cool way. But again, I don't wanna spoil anything for Janine and Jagger. Um, I think the big picture is that our aim with this episode is really for people all across Canada to know Tom Longboat's name and story you know, as a trailblazing athlete, as a war hero to whom all Canadians owe a great debt, 
as an important member of Six Nations represented today and his descendants, Jagger and Janine. Um, so I'll turn it over to Tex, who can tell you a little bit more about our specific ask. Thanks, Jean. Um, as Aaron mentioned, we are seeking your permission to film on Six Nations territory for roughly three to four days. The proposed locations are Janine's house, the site of Tom Longboat's homestead, and the Woodlands Cultural Center, former Mohawk residential school. We're aiming to film uh, during spring break to accommodate Jagger's school schedule. However, the overall possible shoot window is from February 21st to April 4th. Crew representation is important to us and we are in discussions uh, currently with a BC-based Talton and Gitsen director to lead the creative of this story. Um, and uh, additionally, we would like to work with a community liaison who can join us on shoot days while on your territory. This would be a paid position and we would look to you for guidance on who the most appropriate person would be. Uh, this is our ask, but of course we are open to discussing what you may need from us in order to proceed. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and your consideration of our presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry, I just wanted to check in with Janine if there's anything further that she'd like to add as well. Um, no, not right now. Okay, perfect. Uh, I will look to any questions or comments from council for the the team they are look there is a request for permission again this was uh, from ethics and so we will look to council on next steps i see sherry lynn has her hand raised i'll move it i'll move okay thanks uh sherry lynn that's moved by sherry lynn is there a seconder looking for a seconder to accept I'll second by Audrey. Are there any further questions or comments? Oh, uh, sorry, Mark. I was I was muted. It's Melba. Yeah, I wanted okay. to say this okay. sounds very exciting. I I wanted to say this sounds very exciting. Uh, one of the reasons is we don't know our history as well as we should. We're dealing right now with residential survivors who who were locked away many years. We didn't have history as well as we should have that was taught in our schools. We were prevented from speaking our own language. And now we have people like uh, the late Tom Longboat who, who is uh, very dear to us and many more in this community who have excelled at many, many things. So I certainly uh, hope that uh, we would be Six Nations, the first to hopefully see this documentary and assist in uh, in raising raising the interest and understanding of our history and who our ancestors were and what they did for our community and the world. So thank you very much. Coming forward, team. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your wholeheartedly agree. Uh, Nathan, your hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Chief, and, and thanks for the presentation and coming forward in, in, in this manner. A um, couple of things, um, just as a suggestion, um, one of the things I would suggest is um, just building on what Melba was saying. Uh, I think we don't know, and, and it's true, we don't know enough about our history. And, and uh, we're always continuously learning um, on a consistent basis, I would suggest. Um, that uh, as a community, um, once it's ready, that we do uh, kind of a, a showing um, just for the community um, so that we can bring the community together and, and all witness this ourselves, uh, of course, with the permission of Janine and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and also that um, in order to promote this, um, that while the production goes forward and it's being released to the public, that we also you know, promote this heavily on our own social media channels going forward. 
Uh, and finally, just uh, I, I heard the, the mention that uh, woodland would be used as a filming. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, filming going on down there, uh, Chief, and, and I'm sure you're going to do this, but just to check in with the survivor secretary and give them a heads up that there's a film crew coming down on a particular day, uh, just so they're aware as well. So those are my suggestions and, and wholeheartedly support this initiative going forward. suggestions uh, and highlighting those pieces. Uh, I tuned in, I think this is very uh, important work and just want to congratulate all of you. There's been a few, I think, I think one or two other documentaries, I'm not sure, that, that were filmed uh, on on Tom Longbo. I'm not sure if, if Janine, if uh, there's other further, I know Cindy, Cindy was doing some work with one of those as well. Uh, but again, it's so important to see, to continue to highlight all of his, uh, you know, one his challenges but obviously his successes as well i think that's what really made you know him even further stand out here at six nations uh, all his all of his uh, you know things that he went through all while doing so much uh, and was a proud member of six nations so it really means a lot uh, to our community I appreciate definitely the comments uh, coming from council so it's been moved uh, and seconded are there any further questions or comments okay so Seeing or hearing none. Oh, I see Janine. I just want to say thank you to Lark Productions and you know to Six Nations Council for this opportunity. You know, it's something that we haven't done before. You know, so it's uh, it really is a nice honor to our family. Um, it's not just Jagger and I and our family. You know, I, I I come from a family of eight, so I'm the youngest of eight. You know. My, my brothers and sisters all want to be involved somehow and, you know, but, you know, a lot are shy, but just, just being there and, and letting people know, you know, this is who we are and this is where we come from. So I appreciate the opportunity and, and yeah, you're right. Like, you know, my great grandpa Tom was in the, in the residential school system as well. So um, yes, it's bringing light, a light to a lot of history that was never told to us. So it'll be nice. It'll be nice to have them here. Yeah. Family, of course. I just want to say thank you again to everyone for considering this and also your thoughtful comments. And I think for all of us, it's really important that a show like this, while it starts as a four part event series around World War II, we really look forward to trying to dive in and tell these kinds of stories because we realize there's an absence in, the, in, in television. So uh, just to your comment, Nathan, we will provide um, assets for social media. We'll make sure that you get trailers and access to that as well. We can share all of that. And our intention would be, we'd love to do a community screening and participate if it's helpful. COVID aside, we'll see where we are a year from now, but um, but we'll make sure that you have what you need so you can do that and share it with the community. And, and again, to Jagger and Janine, thank you for everything you've done and, and to council and chief, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Go to the vote now, council, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motion is Carried. Motion to waive second reading. I'll move. Moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Audrey. All in favor? Oh, Any opposed? Yeah. You're hearing in motion is carried. Okay, well, thank you to all for joining us this evening. I really look forward to the next steps here uh, on this uh, initiative. And again, want to just congratulate um, really everyone on this initiative. Okay, it's going to be great. I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you so Have much. Have a good Take meeting. Care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, Council, we're, we're, we're moving through here the agenda. We have one more delegation on our agenda, which is a, an application uh, from Lisa Bomberry and Sam Gray, which is a call toward a comprehensive post secondary education model for Six Nations River. Um, so I'll look to is any is Lisa or Sam on the line? Chief. Yeah, sorry, Michelle. So I'm gonna de declare a conflict and, and I think you're you're cutting out or you're very low. 
when you're speaking. Oh, my apologies. Can you hear me now? Okay. Sorry, I'm my, uh, I don't know what's going on. Some technical difficulties. The joys. Sounds good though now. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. So I see Sam on the line. I'm here. Sam. Okay. Can you hear me okay? And is Lisa. Yes, we can hear Lisa you. Can't, Lisa can't join us now, so it's it's uh, just me presenting. Okay, that's great. What I'll do then is, is welcome you to General Counsel, and I'll pass the floor uh, right over to yourself for your presentation. Let me see if I can figure out screen sharing. be lightly frozen here. Oh. It's, it says it's sharing the screen. You may have to take it down, Sam, and then re redo it. Yep, giving it my best. <laughs> Okay, just checking. Not sure why it froze. <clears throat> yeah, it's not it's not responding. I don't know if someone can uh, seize the screen back. Uh, no. And if not, then we do have copies that are uploaded into our Dropbox. I believe they do have uh, your your presentation, so you may just have to walk through it. That's very strange. It's literally never done this to me before. Hey, are you able just to uh, walk us through if that's if the share screen? If you take stop the share screen. Apologies that we're having a little bit of technical difficulties to those online watching. Okay, Sam, and maybe what I'll just get you to do is if you can maybe just walk through uh, your presentation via audio, we'll go from there. Go. Hey, here we go. <laughs> it, it's working now. Is my mic still working? Yes. Yes, Excellent. we can hear you. All right. Well, I, I, with apologies for that hiccup, um, I wanted to, to start by thanking you for, for making time for the ethics review tonight. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm presenting on behalf of the team working on the project toward a comprehensive post-secondary education model for six nations of the Grand River. This presentation accompanies the completed protocol and the research instruments that we submitted to the Ethics Committee. I'm gonna be presenting and responding to questions about the research process. While we have a few people in attendance representing uh, either GRIPCO or SNP who can speak to some broader aspects of the project. So tonight's presentation takes us through from introducing the research team to discussing our knowledge mobilization strategy and answering questions about the project. In our presentation, uh, we're focusing on material that complements rather than repeating what appears in the protocol document. We've also made the slides and the speakers available so that the presentation can be reviewed easily. So our project team consists of our principal investigators and a development officer who provides support for the primary and secondary research activities undertaken by the PIs. Our first principal investigator is Lisa Bomberry. She's a community member with a strong background in the project's areas of focus. Most notably for our purposes today, she's an expert facilitator who uses culturally grounded methods in her community engagement activities. She couldn't be here tonight, but her credentials and her experience are detailed here on this slide so that they are available for review. 
My own qualifications are also detailed on the slide, highlighting some of my training and research methodologies and some of my experience with So this project has its roots in an important shift a little over two years ago in the Canadian government's approach to strategizing post-secondary education supports for Indigenous nations. Federal bud budget 2019 allocated multi-year funding for First Nations to undertake exploratory discussion, community consultation, and partnership tables. Through the collaborative work of the National Indian Education Council and ISC, Indigenous Services Canada, resources were secured for engagement processes through which First Nations could develop regional models that really addressed their own unique post-secondary needs and their own unique local priorities. So seven and a half million dollars was allocated over three years with ISC's guidelines announced in March 2019. ISC's call for work plans appeared in November of 2020, at which time Gripsio submitted their winning application. The following summer, Six Nations Polytechnic responded to Gripsio's request for proposals and was selected to lead the current project. So to clarify, this research project is part of the National Post-Secondary Engagement Initiative funded by Indigenous Services Canada. So SMP's proposal was very detailed, outlining our methodology, our timeline, our processes, risks and contingencies, all of which underwent an initial review by Gripsio before the contract was awarded. Of course, a second review by the Six Nations Ethics Committee was part of our proposed activities, bringing us all here together today. There was, however, a third review proposed to be undertaken by a specially convened quality assurance committee. Our work is answerable to community, to the funder, and to broader ethical concerns, including Indigenous knowledge protocols. And it was our desire to respond to these responsibilities in a good-minded way that led us to add these several layers of accountability measures. So although the exact composition of the QA committee is yet to be developed, because it needs to be a cooperative process, it's proposed that it would consist of the leadership, Six Nations PSE organizations, Indigenous knowledge guardians, teaching and learning community stakeholders, and relevant subject matter experts. So it's well documented that current funding is very inadequate to meet the needs of Indigenous learners and to support capacity development in community-based post-secondary institutions and learner support organizations which means that identifying a regional model to serve local needs and priorities is not merely timely, but is actually critical. And accordingly, our aim is to contribute a fundamentally local, learner-driven perspective to the current strategizing going on around post-secondary education models. In meeting this purpose, our project is guided by three interrelated research questions. What does a regional PSE model for Six Nations of the Grand River look like? What do the community's post-secondary learners need to succeed? And what is the role of PSE providers and local organizations in supporting learner success? Our research process was designed to help us answer those questions in the most appropriate, the most expedient, and the most grounded fashion. So our secondary data sources are expansive and diverse with a particular focus on locally produced knowledge. There have been a number of prior educational research initiatives at Six Nations. Uh, however, nothing has looked at post-secondary in and of itself. While, as we all know, so much has changed over every part of the sector these past 19 months. So to the best of our knowledge, this is the first project to bring all of these elements together, to look at the research that's already been done using fresh eyes and asking some critical questions like how recent published studies are, what's already been asked of local stakeholders, if certain questions have already been asked, might they need to be posed in a different way, who has already been surveyed and interviewed and who has yet to have an opportunity to participate, what has changed about post-secondary education since prior research was undertaken, and overall, is there anything missing from the picture that emerges from the secondary research? The project uses a participatory mixed methods approach based in Indigenous methodologies. Our sources are those studies, reports, and literatures we just mentioned. Primary data we intend to gather from surveys, from interviews, and from organizational input. And our ongoing analyses as a research team informed by the expert feedback that we receive from a number of sources. Right now, we're a little over halfway through the project in terms of the overall timeline. Specifically, we are at the juncture between the secondary research 
and the primary research for which we are applying for ethics review today. We've completed all the secondary data collection and produced our preliminary analyses. These provide a very rough map that will be elaborated by our interviews and by our survey respondents, along with input from the four PSE delivery and support organizations here at Six Nations. Ideally, we'd like to upload the online survey and send out the interview invitations first thing in the new year so that we can be moving steadily toward being able to present and discuss our findings in March, 2022. Something that we wanted to address specifically in our presentation is how the project work is guided by the values of the good mind and in a, a very grounded and a very practical way. Fairness is right at the core of the work because we're addressing the need for a quality of educational outcomes as a basic principle of justice. We're also responding to the needs of the Six Nations community and more broadly to that call for concrete action in pursuit of indigenous educational sovereignty. The next four values combine to guide our methodology and our strategy to mobilize the outcomes. Our plans and our actions are rooted in sharing and confidentiality, which combine with the kindness and the openness that guide the facilitation of community forums in our attempt to create a safe space for participants to share their experiences and their aspirations. More broadly, and in everything we do together, as individual researchers and as a project team, we hold ourselves to the highest standards of professional conduct and trustworthiness, so that in turn, the integrity of the research process will be embedded in and will be clearly visible in the research outcomes. And finally, as a fundamentally collaborative undertaking, cooperation is the glue that binds all of us together and which ensures that our findings represent a diversity of insights, experiences, and understandings. So as I said, we're right on the cusp of the second leg of research in which we will finally be able to welcome participants. So the project is centering community voices in both data gathering and data analysis. And we're doing this in a relational way because all of these perspectives are fundamentally interrelated. So learners, their families, the local organizations they attend and that support them in their study form communities within the community. Our relational approach is centered on families, which is a me methodological choice we made for a number of reasons. Most families have a range of experiences with post-secondary education. For example, different members may pursue their own educational pathway, or they may go on to work in post-secondary themselves. Alongside this diversity, there can be important similarities in the various influences that family members experience and how those impact their choices. These forces travel both laterally across one generation and down through different generations. And sharing these narratives aligns with our project's storytelling methodology. We also wanted to ground this work in strengths instead of deficits. So focusing not on what indigenous learners lack or what they need to compare to non-indigenous learners in other municipalities, but what six nations learners need to realize their gifts and realize their aspirations. And ultimately, Family is a core element of the journey that we all take. In terms of actual participant selection, our criteria are detailed in the ethics protocol we submitted. Overall, we're looking at engaging an unlimited number of survey respondents and between 40 and 60 interviewees representing the groups we've discussed, current learners, alumni, families, and staff of local PSE organizations. Our recruitment process involves sending out invitations that explain the project and the opportunity to participate using email distribution lists and social media. We also hope that word of mouth will carry the invitation that little bit further. Specific outreach narratives that have been drafted are included in the protocol. And when research participants do join the project, there will be a number of processes and tools in place to protect their interests. We've included our consent form for interviewees and our implied consent statement for those online survey respondents. Uh, these have been drafted to ensure that truly free and substantively informed consent will be secured for every single project activity. Power over relationships include that research participants could be friends, could be colleagues, could be family members of either a project team member or of someone who works for one or both a group CO or SNP. So to offset this, we plan to use Generic communications, meaning emails will come from a specially designated project address rather than from an individual. We will share outreach activities 
and we will provide assurances in the consent materials that make it clear that declining to participate has no negative implications of any kind. We are providing remuneration for participation, including prizes and honoraria. This is for two reasons. To incentivize the survey, because online surveys typically have a rather low response rate, and to provide fair compensation for time contributed to the research. Neither one of these provides undue inducement to participate, and interviewees may keep their honorarium should they decide to revoke their consent. And revoking their consent uh, is explained as a, a contingency in the consent letter. So there are two kinds of identity and disclosure considerations that any project has to consider. The first is whether the research team themselves can identify participants, which is anonymity. The second is whether anyone who reads the project outputs will be able to identify participants. That's confidentiality. So data collected through our online survey will be both anonymous and confidential. We've set it up that way. Data collected through interviews, of course, cannot be anonymous. It can, however, be made confidential. In both our surveys and our interviews, participants are asked if they would like to be credited in the research results. They'll be able to indicate if they want their input to be attributed to them individually, for example, through a direct quotation, or if they would simply like to be named as a project contributor. We've thought carefully about the three types of risks any research project must offset including to participants, to the project team members themselves, and to heritage, including Indigenous knowledge. Our study qualifies as minimal risk, according to the Tri-Council's definition and criteria. Nevertheless, we have put protections in place, including facilitation that is trauma-informed, with an initial debriefing and the provision of referrals to additional resources and supports, along with that Quality Assurance Committee, who will review our actual findings and evaluate whether any content should be revised or even removed. So this final section of our presentation looks at knowledge mobilization. Findings from this study have a wide range of potential beneficiaries if they're made available in appropriate forms and through carefully chosen forms. Part of the project built right into Gripsio's initial call for proposals was that a presentation to council was part of the project outputs. Additional pathways to bring these research findings and recommendations to the community and to a wider audience include using it as a basis for inter-organizational learning and cooperation. For example, by convening working groups or ad hoc committees to discuss how to operationalize recommendations or holding workshops on next steps that the project team didn't think of. It can also be the seed, other reports, policy briefs, snapshots. There will certainly be opportunities to use the project final report to generate best practices documents drafted from a Six Nations learner perspective. And of course, conferences, professional and academic, would be a natural place for aspects of the final report to land and the publications that attach to and come out of these kinds of venues. And finally, the final report intends to sketch potential positive change and so lends itself naturally to advocacy work. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the formal presentation and opens up the floor for questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Neil. For, for that very thorough and detailed presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, I'll look to, if I can, I'll thank you for stop sharing your screen as well. I'll look for any uh, questions or comments at this time. I see Audrey has her hand raised. Yeah, well done, Sam, and the entire team. Uh, I think it's absolutely wonderful, and it's about time that we, as Six Nations, asked our students and our families what we need more, what strengths we have, and how do we build on those strengths to make sure all of our students are success successful with their gifts. Uh, but I, I would like to, at this time, uh, Sam, to ask you uh, basically to clarify how you use the word regional model, that it's not, it's not the big region in Ontario, that it's meant other ways. Could you do that, please? Yes, Audrey, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, the, Regional models are certainly being proposed that constitute something like a province or something like, you know, uh, southwestern Ontario as a region. Uh, after a, a quite a bit of discussion, uh, we've determined that six nations of the Grand River itself can constitute a region using um, the, the most durable definitions of that, which is 
It is uh, the largest by population uh, in Indigenous community in Canada, uh, and also holds a number, a number of other characteristics that constitute it as a region. I mean, if the Greater Toronto Region <laughs> is a region, uh, then Six Nations certainly has a claim to, to similar. You know, uh, I see Shiver Lynn has her hand raised. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, I guess my question, my first question is, are you going to be doing the students who, um, or somehow if they do come forward, who didn't get funded, didn't get funded or was told not enough funding? We have, we've determined that that's actually a really important category is self-funded students um, who pursued and self-funded students who did not uh, choose to pursue or were not able to pursue. Um, one of the most important categories. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure because you're right, because that's a big one that a lot um, don't get funded or they're told that there's not enough funding. The other one that I have too is um, the back and forth. I don't know how you would do it because I think in, a, in our community, um, it goes, you go to post-secondary or, or you, they go to great. It says, no, you gotta go to Polytech or no, you gotta go to, <laughs> you gotta go to um, post-secondary. Oh no, we don't do that. You gotta go, you know what I mean? I'm not sure how you could do that, but there's a lot of um, runaround in, in some cases. How do we get that also? And, and um, just a thought. And the other one I have too is, I see you know, there was something about mental health mental health and well-being with the students i've seen that kind of in your questionnaire but i was just wondering um like the access but i see that there's a a toll free mental health line created by the ministry of training colleges and universities the good the good to talk for post-secondary supports and they they can text so i guess that's my question are, are you going to be asking like more of the of those kinds of things i know that there'd be an at the indigenous um uh like room the rooms the supports they have but what other supports are they using that's all i'm asking because they do have that good to talk those are great who's on the <laughs> Uh, I think that colors and definitions are one of the first things that we we discussed as a project team. We were we started with the term post secondary, and the way that that's defined uh, differently within the community than it's defined by the ministries that that adjudicate what qualifies as post secondary. I mean, the term itself means anything after secondary. So why is it restricted to college and university? Why does it exclude skilled trades? Why does it exclude other parts of lifelong learning? So part of the, the work that we've been doing is challenging some definitions as being uh, as serving a better bureaucratic agenda than a practical one and the ways that it can estrange learners from each other and from services. Um, and the second part of your question, we, we took our questions around student supports out of what the mainstreams provide what the IIs provide and what came out of the AFN's categorizations in their 2018 report. So we're really interested in finding out supports that were available and accessed, that were available but the student never knew they were there, and supports that they wish had existed and, and didn't at the time that they were there. And just, thank you for that. Sherry Lynn. So just follow up, follow up to you. Yeah, and the only the reason why I, I asked the questions because when I sat on um, post secondary, those were some of the questions in the sense of they didn't get funded or not enough funds, those kinds of things, and the back and forth. Exactly, and some of the ways that that again that those categories define you out of out of existence or out of having a particular need or define your need as not being fundable or not being visible. So we do want to get at, at those issues. If it's a regional model and it's unique to Six Nations, then let it be unique. I just have a quick question before I go to any further. Um, is in relation to the lifelong learning, and maybe perhaps I do see uh, uh, someone, perhaps maybe Heather on the line, or maybe Audrey can assist. Uh, in answering this is how, <clears throat> in terms of aligning, so what does this, this 
now contribute to the overall work or mandate of the lifelong learning task force. Sorry, it's not really. A, is it? Oh, there's, there's yeah, nothing. this is Heather here on the line. Um, yeah, I can jump in here for this question. Yeah, so uh, at our most recent uh, update with political liaison, uh, when we presented our new timeline uh, of the LLTF uh, being, you know, out a little bit further than originally stated, uh, looking to June uh, 2023 to wrap up the work, uh, that becomes inclusive of uh, early years as well as post-secondary, um, where previously uh, we were focusing just on uh, 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 kindergarten through 12th grade. And so, uh, you know, we're very much uh, in involved in terms of sitting, uh, sitting um, kind of in a more observatory role um, at this table and, and learning about uh, you know what it is that that is going on and, and the specific needs um, and wants and successes of, of our students and uh, this will this will definitely be uh, uh, in informing our work uh, going forward. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you uh, for, for that response, uh, Heather. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, I just want to, I'll look to, sorry, Shirley, can you just confirm do I need a mover and seconder, is that correct? Or do I already have one? We need a mover and seconder, Chief. Okay, thank you for that, Shirley. Okay, Council, uh, for this is our last uh, delegation this evening. Uh, Sam has laid out the presentation, now looking for the approval of this is our motion to mover to that effect. Moved by Audrey, seconder. Second by Nathan. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing that, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Audrey, seconder. Second by Nathan, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing in motion is carried. Well, thank you so much, Sam and Heather, and to all those on the line, I see Justine, Rebecca, uh, for all that you do in this, in this entire sector. I know education is such a huge file uh, and there's so much more work to continue. Uh, so really just appreciate all of your work through this. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Apologies again for the, the technical glitches. <laughs> All good. That's, that's part of our daily Zoom lives now. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Okay, Council, uh, that leads us into our next agenda item, uh, which is the request from the Woodland Cultural Center for a Political Board Representative. As you see, there is a recommendation on there. Just wanted to check in. Uh, with Michelle, if she's still agreeable to this appointment to the Woodland Cultural Center. Yeah, I, I was under the impression it would come to council and whoever wanted to. I, I know they did approach me, but I thought there was a process to uh, open it up to see if others wanted to sit. But if well, not, I, I can. I, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for that. I, I think, well, if we could maintain your name, because we will have a little bit more work to do as we transition to our next, uh, what we're doing in our governance sector here in terms of portfolio system and so forth. So we'll have to do a little more work, but I think this is a great appointment uh, in, in term and for now as we maneuver through our next steps. Uh, that being said, is there a motion to mover and seconder to the recommendation? Uh, moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Nathan. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. A motion to waive second reading. Moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Nathan, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, that leads us into our next uh, agenda item, which is the adoption of the General Council Minutes of November 23rd. And thank you for that, Michelle, as well. I'll move. Moved by Michelle. Seconder. Hello. 
second by Carrie. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to the minute? Audrey? Yeah, I was absent that day due to bereavement in the family, and you have me as present and absent. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. Are there any further edits? Okay, seeing or hearing that, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motion is carried. Uh, moving into recommendations from the Human Services Committee, recommendation seven. I'll need a new mover in place of Hazel. I don't believe Hazel's joined the line. She did send an email saying she uh, would be running late. Okay, seeing our here, I'll look to the mover, Sherilyn. I'll move for Hazel. Okay, move, moved by Sherry Lynn. Thanks for that. Uh, and it's seconded by Audrey. Uh, that the Human Services Committee recommends to the Six Nations the Grand River Elected Council to waive the tendering process and contract for KNL Martin Associates to provide archi architectural design and contract administration services for the construction of the modular uh, homes for the before and after school program in the amount of $35,265 and that these funds come from the Federal Indigenous Early Learning and Child Care Funds. So that sounds like a, a recommendation from social services. Um, we're looking to the suggested rewording, if that's okay with the mover and seconder. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Is there a motion to waive second reading? Moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Audrey. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, just before we move to scheduling, I'm going just to provide, and please feel free I, to those who also were part uh, of the Assembly of First Nations, the, uh, the Assembly last week, rather. <laughs> I'm going to just do a quick verbal update on some of the highlights uh, impacted here at Six Nations and some of the decisions made from our lens. Um, and just really quickly, this is verbal. We'll be through Jill and I. Uh, we'll be forwarding on the meeting, the actual meeting report, which will be even further detailed. Uh, but I really just want to give a high level verbal report uh, on the meeting. So day one, again, it was very um, concerning in relation to the amount of chiefs and proxies present. Um, at the beginning of day one, there was 41 chiefs uh, giving the, leaving the quorum at 25 uh, to make decisions on behalf of the country, which is very, very concerning. Um, but again, started all with the opening uh, comments um, from the regional chief was involved in there. Uh, national chief uh, gave her opening uh, statements uh, some of her some of her comments included obviously the First Nation recovery from the pandemic, uh, a larger prosperity table again, which uh, we're trying to already work on those pieces, reaching out to the U the UN High Commission regarding the accountability charges for the loss of the children at the residential schools, um, as well as the administration and secretariat uh, in terms of the restructured. Um, so she touched on a little bit of those pieces, opening up the meeting. Uh, there was again a few uh, resolutions that uh, that were passed uh, in relation to the first one uh, was the First Nations uh, participation uh, in the development of the distinctions based health legislation, um, as well as there was still an issue brought forward regarding COAM in terms of the AFN Charter Challenge. So that was uh, Proxy Harper, again, questioning regarding the quorum and understanding that there were only 22 chiefs. Uh, or 25 rather to meet quorum for that day. Um, obviously the rules and procedure are, were lacking for this area because the start the charter does state 60% of chiefs and proxies uh, are present uh, to make quorum. Um, the chair and co-chair went on to a few different items in terms of the technicians that were registered. So they were back and forth. There was, but, uh, there was different sessions that went on uh, through that day. Uh, that day was also met with uh, Minister Miller, uh, as well as Minister Lametti, and as well as Minister Haidu. 
Uh, so there was, uh, again, all their opening comments, which is going to be in the detailed report. But one of the items that also was touched on that I just on day one was in relation to the emergency resolution uh, of, in, in relation to the Wet'suwet'en uh, First Nation. So that went back and forth. And, and in fact, there was some, there was some discussion there that occurred between uh, you know, the elected chief there, uh, as well as different chiefs that were bringing forward the motion, but didn't actually consult or talk with the elected chief of the Wet'suwet'en. So that ended up uh, getting deferred to the, the next day after chiefs felt that, you know, that the AFN should not be getting involved in internal matters. Um, and so that, that, that is how we ended day one. Moving into day two, again, same, same concern with the chiefs and proxies present. Uh, there's approximately, I think, 40-ish chiefs on the second day, uh, which would make quorum about 24 chiefs or proxies. Uh, again, super low. Uh, you know, the agenda obviously was uh, talking about the National Chiefs strategic direction for the AFN, some of the vision and values and the mission and goals on, on how to, uh, you know, best move forward while her uh, term, um, while her term goes on. She talked a little bit about the, the healing path forward and again, focusing on action. Uh, all these pieces, again, are going to be detailed within the, the written report. Uh, there was a number of motions. One thing that I wanted to highlight was these, and maybe even Nathan can perhaps uh, further comment on this, but I, I took a lot of uh, issue and concern and I raised at the assembly in relation to these omnibus bills, or, or resolutions rather, uh, that are basically all packaged in one. And if you're not, this is something that they clarified for me because there, there was one item on a resolution in relation to education, post-secondary education, where we agreed with one portion of it, the one resolution attached, but we didn't agree um, uh, with the, the others. So, you know, so how, we either had to vote abstain or vote no to then turn down all three. So those that was based upon just the, this how it's structured uh, in, in an omnibus resolution. Uh, but the, and I understand in terms of you know timing of of, of these assemblies and you know, the getting resolutions to the floor, we were still dealing with resolutions from the last assembly, which we were already at a disadvantage, I believe, in terms of our timing. Uh, but I did take issue with those and, and brought that up in relation to process um, and how, um, again, you know, we were approved or rather in support of one of the resolutions, but not in support of the other two. So those are some of the, the areas. So I, again, uh, went through each one, uh, Jill and I going back and forth through, through uh, our discussions earlier with, uh, again, Ontario and positioning ourselves on different uh, resolutions. One resolution that I did end up moving was in relation uh, to uh, the Indian Day School and the independent review, uh, as well as the extension of the in Indian Day School applications. So we know what we're hearing, you know, huge concern with uh, people who've applied for a level one and receive the ten thousand dollars, but later than thinking, or uh, you know, different under different circumstances, you know, feel that they should have received more. So those are some of the conversations as to why the chiefs were obviously uh, in support of that because they're seeing those same concerns uh, within their communities. Um, and so those were just the just the highlight pieces of of the of the um, assembly. There was uh, it, they went very long days. Uh, you know, we tried to stay on as long as we can. I think the longest was 7.30 p.m. There were still resolutions that needed to go forward. I did put forward the resolution in relation to the uh, financial services and the banking issues that, you know, some of our, our members are having uh, with banks. Um, and so that's, that's one item. I've, I've touched base with some of the technicians, that, although it was uh, seen as a late resolution and because the resolution package wasn't even completed, uh, it was unable to reach the floor. However, there's still action that we can take as opposed to, you know, as if we had that resolution. So we're, I'm working with some technicians already at the AFN to help uh, at least, uh, you know, drive that resolution forward and trying to make some concrete action on, on that uh, item. But again, just wanted to just give a high level. I'm sorry if I've taken a few minutes longer, um, but wanted to just give that update from last week's assembly. Uh, very concerning. We'll have further our own analysis complete. I know that's something that we're going to be bringing back forward. Uh, that was part of Jill's work uh, when she first started her role. Um, and so there's some 
there's some good findings and I think findings that we've already known as well in that in that analysis. Um, and so it's something that I think we need to also uh, have a thorough good discussion in terms of our strategic direction and where we go. You know, and I think that's something that we've always maintained is you know, Six Nations will speak for Six Nations uh, and no other uh, you know, organization. Uh, maybe if I can just pause, I see Nathan has his hand raised. Question, comment? Yeah, just a just a quick comment. Um, I don't want to be a broken record, but you guys know my position on on both regional and national organizations. But I, I think it's becoming, and and I take your points, Chief. It's becoming more and more concerning because there's a trend happening, and that trend speaks to the disunity. If and in coup seem to be. Uh, putting in place a number of processes and procedures that promote disunity rather than unity. And we're seeing that across the board. Um, last week was a classic example where there are unnecessary fights on the floor. Um, and the Wet'suwet'en situation was a classic example where, you know, a lack of communication resulted in an un not unnecessary fight on the floor. That Those things create disunity. And, and these assemblies, they're supposed to create unity amongst in indigenous people across the country and, and they're not doing that. And I think we really, if, if we're going to go down the path of you know, preserving these organizations, I think we need to start doing some work to, to help them promote unity if, if that's what we wanna do. I don't know if that's the direction we wanna go. Um, personally, I think we can put our energies elsewhere. Um, I think there's things outside of these assemblies and um networks and uh, partners and and our fellow nations that we um have a have an opportunity to create some you know good initiatives going forward that create unity um so that's kind of uh where my head was at um but there is a need for these organizations you know issues important issues like indian day schools there's there's a need to, to kind of continue going down that path the other one is CHRT, um, such an important issue that, that impacts everyone, where AFN and KU do have a role. But these issues where there is unity is starting to get few and far between. Um, so I think there's um, there's going to be some a real need for us to look at some strategic directions going forward. The other issue I heard, which was really disconcerting, is I, I really didn't mind the, re the National Chief's strategic plan because I think what she wanted to do was actually blow the thing up and look at new ways of doing business, evolving the organization. Um, and, and, you know, it's unfortunate that a few self-serving regional chiefs, you know, blew that up. And again, that created disunity. Um, so there is, there's opportunities and I think we need to look strategically and, and I like your approach where we're always looking strategically at these two organizations and and how best we can move forward based on our priorities. Um, your point about the the omnibus that that the, the approach that they took was actually against the charter. Um, so they're not even following their own rules uh, in that omnibus thing because you can't expect leadership to do what you had to do. <laughs> You know that that was that's not fair um, from a number of standpoints. So um, yeah, I think going forward, uh, I think we need to con just continue doing the work that we're doing, continue doing the analysis and collecting the good data, and making good strategic decisions on which issues we take to those uh, tables, but also start opening those opportunities with our partners, with uh, with our you know the the Iroquois caucus outside of those two bodies. That way, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more initiatives, um, see success and, and the partnerships ease because we don't have the tools of disunity that KU and AFN are starting to use against their own people, which is very unfortunate. Thank you for your comments. I think, you know, I agree. It, it could have been even more. I think it's that better to start to really look at the the formats of these assemblies. And that's what I had mentioned at, on the floor in relation to, sorry, my audio is really quiet, I apologize. Uh, but that's what I mentioned on the floor, uh, you know, when, when bringing this issue forward of the omnibus process, because, you know, for, to me, it's how can we then now look to 
you know, if we're here to do business and get work done and we're taking time away from our communities to attend these assemblies to make these important decisions, then we need to be structured in a way that is, is to, has the utmost efficiencies. And that's something that I didn't see in these formats that were, you know, the agendas that were given out and, and, and approved and passed. I just didn't, I, I feel like the formats could be restructured in a way that we actually focus in on the actual business and get it done as opposed to listening constantly to presentation, to presentation, you know, and then really the, you're leaving resolutions to day three. So nothing gets done in a sense, or we're rushed under duress to get it done. So there's, those were some of my highlights from the assembly. I thought I'd share that through this verbal, uh, verbal update. But again, we do have a detailed report forthcoming that will just highlight everything even further and what I'm saying and just basically how uh, each each of the resolution and what which way we voted on. Again, the omnibus was really a, a struggle for me. I didn't agree with it at all. In fact, a lot of the times, you know, when, when in the cases I would just abstain because of the fact of the process in which we didn't, you know, there were certain resolutions that I could get agree to, but, you know, other resolutions that had, you know, some worded changes or necessary worded changes to me then to get to that agreeable um, stage. So that's just how I, I positioned us in a sense. And But I do agree we can get a lot more done, I think, strategically in which our, our direction, you know, best serves us. So uh, I don't know, maybe if there's any further questions or comments on that verbal update. Okay, seeing or hearing none, I'll again forward on from Jill. Again, Jill had written very detailed update uh, report from the assembly uh, during her three days in attendance as well. Um, I'll look or move to scheduling now on our agenda. Just want to check in with Tammy if I can. Uh, Tammy, in relation to the meeting with the Ministry of Attorney General, is that just a day that needs to be set from council? Just checking in with Tammy on, on the MAG meeting. Yes, that was something that still um, we're looking for a date for, and it'll partly be dependent on council's availability as well as the MAG reps. Okay, so this maybe is, if you I remember think, I this, is, this was uh, brought forward from a couple of meetings ago with Arliss. Yes, yeah. So I'm wondering maybe then, Tammy, if we can look at the obviously the new year to schedule this meeting and then we'll bring it back to full council. Yes, and that was actually one of the things that I wanted to ask with council. Are I have been just picking dates and sending them out, and, and I'm I'm aware that it doesn't always work for everybody. So I'm just wondering, is that something you want me to continue to do, or do you just want me to actually set, set up a poll and and ask for their feedback on availability? I'm just looking for some the best way to move forward with that way we can get everybody's involvement. I know everybody's busy, but I do understand some of these meetings are a priority as well. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Tammy. So I don't see any really movement. Maybe perhaps for now we can keep the same process uh, until uh, we see otherwise. Okay, Council, uh, uh, thanks for that. Looking to our schedule, so tomorrow is Corporate and Emergency Services. Thursday is our uh, meeting uh, with full Council as well as our Senior Administration team. Uh, Monday, the 20th, is our General Finance, uh, and that will be our last meeting of the 2021. So we're, we're approaching uh, the, a new year. So the general finance will be our last uh, Zoom meeting to the public. So that does conclude our evening for general council. I will look for a motion now at this time to adjourn. Is there a mover? Yeah, by Michelle, second, second by Carrie to adjourn. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing and motion is carried. Thank you all for joining us this evening at General Council and look forward to seeing you at General Finance for our last meeting of 2021 public. Thanks for joining. Have a great evening.